Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our pediatric dentistry series. In this video, we're going to talk about pediatric soft tissue. We spent a lot of time in the third video discussing the anatomical features unique to the primary dentition. So in this video, we're going to shift gears and talk about the gingiva and soft tissue of the pediatric patient. So as the dentition changes from primary to permanent, the gingiva also undergoes some massive changes, many of which are associated with normal physiologic eruption. So let's start by talking about color. In children, the gingiva tends to be reddish due to thinner epithelium, less keratinization, and a greater overall vascularity. Whereas in adults, the gingiva, especially the attached gingiva, is a coral pink color. In terms of contour, in children, the gingiva has rolled and rounded margins due to edema or fluid collection that accompanies eruption and also those prominent cervical ridges of the primary teeth. In adults, the margins tend to be knife edge, so they're thinner, sharper, and cleaner. In terms of consistency, the gingiva of a child tends to be flabbier due to less dense connective tissue and a lack of organized collagen, whereas in adults, the gingiva is firm and resilient. And again, this is all; these are all characteristics of healthy, normal gingiva. In terms of texture, the children have lack of stippling due to shorter and flatter papilla. In adults, we have that stippling. And stippling is like an orange peel. You have numerous tiny little specks or indentations on the surface of the gingiva in this case. And then the sulcus tends to be deeper in children because soft tissues more easily split up from the teeth. And this has to do again with eruption and a less connected, less attachment to the tooth. Whereas in adults, at least a, a healthy sulcus should be less deep, but of course we can have periodontal issues, deep pockets, etc. So th these changes should be distinguished from gingival disease, many of which can occur simultaneously with the shift between primary and permanent dentition. So now let's talk about what can go wrong. So gingivitis is very common among children and adolescents specifically, and affects up to 70% of children over the age of seven. Now you can't have gingivitis without some amount of plaque, and you can't have periodontitis without first having gingivitis. So it really all starts with plaque, which is related to poor oral hygiene. And that's why parental participation in oral hygiene until the age of eight is really important and recommended due to a lack of manual dexterity. Mouth breathing, crowded teeth, erupting teeth, and braces may further aggravate inflamed gingiva. A lot of this has to do with difficulty in keeping the teeth clean, uh, less saliva, or just more plaque retention and leading to this aggravation of healthy gingiva, causing inflammation, as we can see here. Gingivitis, like caries, is multifactorial, so many factors are playing a role. And it's thought that hormones can play a role in exacerbating the body's response to plaque. So the term puberty gingivitis refers to enlarged bulbous interproximal gingival tissue on the labial aspects of the anterior teeth. So you can really appreciate that in this image, these inflamed bulbous papilla, particularly in the anterior. So gingival, this gingival irritation and inflammation often peaks at puberty and it's thought to be related to hormones. Now we can also have acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. And this is a specific type of painful gingivitis that is more common in adults but it can occur in children as well. It's also called trench mouth, which comes from World War I, when the disorder was common among soldiers who couldn't keep their teeth clean. 
Now, what I love about this is that each part of the name refers to a specific aspect of the disease, which makes it a lot easier to remember for the board exam. So acute refers to this pain associated with the disease and also a high fever that, it can, that can occur, another acute symptom. Necrotizing refers to tissue that is dying and causes this bad smelling breath. Ulcerative refers to this, these ulcerations. It's a pseudomembrane on the marginal gingiva. And lastly, this is a category, it falls under the category of gingivitis, I should say, and it has bleeding, inflamed, inflamed gums, and blunted papilla, which are, uh, which are consistent with what we would expect from a gingivitis-like disease. Treatment for ANUG refer- includes debridement, oxidizing mouth rinse, and antibiotics as well. Next, we have reduced attached gingiva. Remember, attached gingiva is the more valuable type of gingiva that is firmly attached to underlying bone and is less sensitive than the free gingiva and the oral mucosa. So brushing your teeth can be accomplished generally better if we have an adequate amount of attached gingiva surrounding that tooth. We consider attached gingiva to be reduced when the band is less than about two millimeters wide. So you can see in this tooth and this tooth specifically, that band of attached gingiva, and we're going from that um, free gingival groove to the mucogingival junction, that's certainly not even, might not even be existent for these teeth. So they would be considered, this would be considered reduced attached gingiva. So the most common cause of this is a labial eruption path of the tooth. So say you have a buccally erupting canine that gets crowded out of the arch, and when it erupts, it has less attached gingiva surrounding it. Also, in this case, gingival recession can contribute, and incisors that are pushed forward and proclined significantly can also be a risk factor for reduced attached gingiva. Orthodontics can either help or hurt this periodontal condition, because if you retract and retrocline those incisors to center them over basal bone, the tissue will be less stressed generally. But if you push them and tip them even more forward, you stress the periodontal tissues even more. So it all depends on what you're doing. The treatment for this condition can include a combination of orthodontics and or some type of soft tissue graft. And these are, this is a review from our periodontal periodontic series, we have free gingival graft and connective tissue graft and what those can be used for. Reduced attached gingiva isn't necessarily a problem on its own, but it can lead to a difficulty in keeping those teeth clean. Again, the soft tissue is going to be a lot more sensitive and a lot more vulnerable to other periodontal conditions and defects down the line. All right, next we have the eruption cyst. This is most common in children and most common around incisors and mandibular first molars. It presents clinically as a bump on the crest of the alveolar ridge where a tooth should be. And a radiograph will confirm the diagnosis. You'll see a tooth hiding underneath this radiolucent cyst. The treatment for an eruption cyst, usually nothing and eruptions, that's because eruption cysts are usually asymptomatic and don't require treatment. However, if the cyst is symptomatic, it should be treated with simple surgical excision. All right, next we have the high frenum. And this means that the frenum is attached high up on the alveolar ridge towards the most coronal aspect of the alveolar bone. And gingival recession can be secondary to the constant tugging and pulling on the tissue by this frenum during normal everyday function of the lips and soft tissues. Now, if a frenum is attached into the alveolar crest like this, sometimes you can see in a periapical or panoramic x-ray a notch in the bone right here where the attachment is inserting into that bone. To treat 
a heavy maxillary frenum like this one, often accompanied with a midline diastema, that's a space in between teeth here, what you could do is close that space first and then perform the phrenectomy. The order is important for the board exam because if we reversed this and did the phrenectomy first, you'd have scar tissue that builds up in between those two teeth, which would make it very difficult to close the space and keep it closed without some amount of elastic rebound. So typically, if we were to do these two steps, we would want to close the space first orthodontically and then have the surgery to lessen the attachment at the frenum and perform that phrenectomy. And lastly, we have periodontitis in children. Again, like our ulcerative condition, it's not as common in children because they haven't lived as long and haven't had as much time to accumulate this irreversible bone loss. Now we've talked about the first two at length in our periodontic series. Localized aggressive periodontitis involves the first permanent molars and permanent incisors only, increased AA counts, that's that Acrogatibacter actinomycetum comitans bacteria, we just call it AA for short, and it's most common in African American children. And that's how we remembered this, we had A for aggressive, AA, AA, nice and easy. The treatment for this is surgical intervention and antibiotics. We also have our generalized form, again, very not very common in children, but it can happen, involves entire dentition, it has increased plaque and calculus, which is consistent with the amount of soft tissue and hard tissue damage we're seeing, and the treatment's similar, surgical intervention and antibiotics. The new one here is prepubertal periodontitis, and this one, interestingly enough, involves the primary molars. So it's localized to primary molars, and it's most common again in African-American children. The treatment for this one is debridement and also a course of antibiotics. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Please like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Leonila Bunger, Zahir Anani, Riha Wadwa, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hafnawi, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.